So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Schneck. I'm the Digital Media Manager for Amerisur Financial. I'd like to welcome you to this third part of our Amerisur Presents Banking Basics series. If you haven't had the chance to join us for parts one or two, you can view those sessions on our YouTube channel uh, or by visiting Ameriserve.com slash presents. Uh, we have links out there as well. Uh, but you can still join us today and learn a lot of great stuff. Once again, we have Carrie Mueller, our Senior Vice President of Retail Banking with us, and she's our featured presenter. Today's focus is going to be on credit and debt. And just quickly, as always, I'd like to mention that attendees have been muted upon entering the session in order to avoid any kind of audio interference or feedback. We are recording this session, so please be aware of that. And if you have questions, we invite you to share those with us in the chat. I'll be monitoring that chat window. Uh, it's found in the lower right-hand side of your screen if you're looking for it. And you can submit questions that way throughout Carrie's presentation, and then we'll get to the Q&A at the end. So uh, with that all being said, Carrie, I will let you take over. Thank you, Drew. Well, this will be what our third webinar together to discuss credit and debt and how it can affect our everyday lives. Um, I promise you that this will be somewhat shorter than last week when we discussed budgeting. Uh, not that it's any less important, uh, believe me, uh, but I tried to really highlight the important areas that directly affect our financial lives. And then we can all look forward to our last webinar next week where we tie all three together. So let's begin to understand how to improve your credit, the pros and cons of credit, and managing debt. The main objectives of credit basics we will be covering are what is a credit report, understanding the report, how it works, and how to access your own credit report. So what is a credit report? A credit report is a detailed breakdown of an individual's credit history prepared by a credit bureau. Credit bureaus collect that financial information about individuals and then create credit reports based on that information and lenders use those reports along with other details to determine an applicant's credit worthiness. In the United States, there are three major credit reporting bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Each of these reporting companies collects information about consumers' personal financial details and their bill paying habits to create a unique credit report. Although most of the information is similar, there are often differences between the three reports. But understanding credit reports takes a little bit of time because there are two main types of credit inquiries, hard and soft. Hard inquiries usually occur when you apply for a loan, a mortgage, or a credit card, but they often come with a price. Let me point out that hard inquiries can hurt your credit score since most scoring pay attention to how often you apply for credit. Soft inquiries provide a basic overview of your credit history and won't impact your credit score. For example, pre-screened credit card or loan officers typically rely on soft inquiries. Now, how credit reports work? The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is the regulatory agency that controls each credit bureau once that report uh, gets created, it's slightly different, and each one is slightly different, but most are split into four or five main sections. The first one is your personal information. And that includes any name that you've ever used in connection with an account, your date of birth, social security number, and any former addresses you may have had. The second includes credit account information, which includes current and past credit accounts, such as credit cards, loans and mortgages, account balances, payment histories, and how long each account has been open. The other one is debt collection. They may appear if a lender has ever transferred overdue account payments to an external collection agency. Fourth are public records, which list applicable history 
any history that you may have on bankruptcies, foreclosures, liens, or civil suits. And finally, recent inquiries, which lists any entities that have recently inquired about your credit, like credit card companies or lenders. So if you submit an application for credit, an insurance policy, or even a rental property, these creditors, insurers, and landlords, and even other people are legally allowed to access your credit report. Employers may also request a copy of your individual's credit report as long as you agree and grant permission in writing. These entities typically must pay the credit bureaus for the report, which is how the credit bureaus earn money. So make sure to review your credit report before you need it. Just to give you an example why this is so important, uh, when I was a manager at one of the branches, I had a client of mine who was applying for a home mortgage. And when the bank pulled his credit report, there was over 20,000 of credit card debt on the report, but the client didn't have any credit cards. What had happened was that the client had the same name as his father. So when the credit report was run, it pulled their correct information, but also accidentally pulled the father's credit card balances. So make sure to check for errors before you think you will need to apply for credit so you can have them fixed if there are any. Not doing this could possibly delay your credit decision or cause your lender to think twice about lending you credit. Ultimately, it's going to delay a time-sensitive purchase. Credit reports also list credit inquiries and details of accounts that could be turned over to credit agencies, let's say liens or wage garnishments. Generally, credit reports retain negative information for seven years, while bankruptcy filings typically stay on credit reports for about 10 years. So now we're going to switch gears and look at a credit score. A credit score predicts how likely you are to pay back a loan on time. A scoring model uses information from your credit report to create a credit score. Companies use credit scores to make decisions such as whether to offer you a mortgage, credit card, auto loan, or other credit products. They are also used to determine the interest rate you receive on a loan or credit card and the credit limit. A credit score then is a three digit number, typically between 300 and 850, designed to represent your credit risk or the likelihood you would pay your bills on time. A general look at credit score ranges are usually 300 to 579 is considered a poor average score. 580 to 669 is considered a fair score. 670 to 739 is considered good. 740 to 799 is considered very good. And then anything really over 800 is considered excellent. To keep in mind, there is no one credit score. It is important to know that you do not have just one credit score and there are many credit scores available to you as well as to lenders. Any credit score depends on the data used to calculate and many differ depending upon the scoring model they use, the source of your credit history, the type of loan product you are applying for, and even the day when it was calculated. For example, you may see one score online provided by your credit card company, and it's 726. Another one could be 698 if you signed up for a separate free credit report monitoring service, and then you checked your score there. And then another one could be 711 when your auto lender showed you the credit score it used to evaluate your loan application. At any given point in time, Lenders are probably looking at slightly different scores than the ones that you actually see. Scores can also be calculated at different times in different ways. Your scores are not calculated on a fixed schedule. 
So then again, it depends on when the data is updated at a reporting company or when your score is actually calculated. So parts of the credit score business really are beyond your control. What you can do though is to make it a habit to check your credit reports each year to fix any errors. The way you use and repay debt affects your credit score. So your score can be helpful in improving your credit use and behavior. And paying your loans on time and staying well below your credit limit can also help you get and keep good credit scores. But how do you access your credit report? The Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is the federal law that controls the fairness and accuracy of your credit reporting, requires each of the three credit re reporting bureaus to supply consumers with a free credit report once per year. On annualcreditreport.com, you are entitled to a free annual credit report from each of the three credit reporting agencies. And these agencies, once again, include Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many people are experiencing financial hardship. To remain in control of their finances, you can get a free credit report every week through April of 2022. Request all three reports at once, or you can do it one at a time. Federal law also entitles consumers to receive free credit reports if any company has taken adverse action against you. So this includes denial of credit, insurance, or employment, as well as reports from collection agencies or judgments. However, consumers must request the report within 60 days from the date the adverse action occurred. In addition, consumers who are on welfare, people who are un unemployed, and plan to look for a job within 60 days, and victims of identity theft are also entitled to a free credit report from each of the reporting agencies as well. Now there's a few ways that you can obtain your credit score. You can check your credit card or other loan statement. I'm sure that many of you have noticed that your Discover statement that you're receiving from your credit card now has your credit score on there. Many major credit card companies and some auto loan companies have begun to provide credit scores for all their customers on a monthly basis. The score is usually listed on your monthly statement or can be found by logging on to your account online. Another way is by using a credit score service. Many of these services and websites advertise free credit scores, but some of these sites may be funded through advertising and not charge a fee, where other sites may require that you sign up for a credit monitoring service with a monthly subscription fee in order to get your free score. These services are often advertised as free trials, but if you don't cancel within the specified period, often as short as one week, you could be on the hook for a monthly fee. So before you sign up to try one of these services, be sure you know what you're signing up for and how much it really costs. And third, you can simply buy your score. You can buy your score directly from the credit reporting company, and you can buy it through myfico.com. Other services may also offer scores for purchase. So if you decide to purchase a credit score, you are not required to purchase any credit protection, identity theft monitoring, or other services that may be offered at the same time. So now let's look at some basics of credit. So now, you know, we move into the basics of credit and what exactly does credit mean? We're gonna look at the different types of credit, the advantages and disadvantages of credit, and how much credit can actually cost us. So what does credit mean? And how do you define credit? This term has many meanings in the financial world, but credit is generally defined as a contract agreement in which a borrower receives a sum of money or something of value and repays the lender at a later date, generally with interest. 
Some common kinds of consumer credit include credit, closed-ended credit, or installment credit, open-ended credit, or non-installment credit, and then two special kinds of credit are debt consolidation and leasing. Service credit includes utility bills for telephones, gas, electricity, even health care. Such service usually must be paid in 7 to 30 days or late fees are added. Future service may not be given if debt is not paid or paid late. Close-ended or installment credit is a credit where you repay the amount owed in a specific number of equal payments, usually monthly. Some closed-end credit contracts involve a single payment due on a set date. Car loans, mortgage loans, and installment loans for appliances or other large purchases are some examples. Installment credit usually involves some form of collateral. For example, if you don't repay your car loan, you can lose your car since it is the collateral for the loan. Now, open-ended or non-installment credit occurs when credit is given before any transaction occurs. Collateral here is usually not required. You can charge up to the limit on your account. So credit cards and open-ended lines, such as maybe a small overdraft protection line on your checking account that a bank may offer, are a few examples. Now, with a debt consolidation loan, you exchange several smaller debts that you are paying monthly with varying due dates and interest rates for a single large loan and interest rate with one monthly payment. So the monthly payment here is usually a lower amount than the total amount of all the monthly payments for the original debt. The interest rate may be lower as well then as the rate you were paying on some of the other ones and on that original on some of the original debt but the time period for repaying your debts with the consolidation loan is now longer, so more interest is going to be paid. While a debt consolidation loan offers relief from debt payments in the short run, it extends the repayment further into the future. So my advice to you is to consider a debt consolidation loan only if you have the willpower to not add more debt until the new loan is completely paid off. In recent years, leasing, especially for vehicles, has become a more acceptable form of credit as well. With leasing, you are essentially renting whatever you lease since ownership remains with the lease grantor. So for example, a car might be a popular choice for leasing. So let's look at some advantages of credit. Using credit does not, it usually has advantages as well as disadvantages. One of those advantages at the top is simply convenience. Using credit cards when you travel or shop is more convenient than carrying cash. It also provides a handy record of transactions. Using a credit card may also give you some bargaining power if there's a dispute or disagreement involving a purchase. It can also, credit can also meet emergencies. Unexpected costs such as car repairs or health needs can be met quickly with credit. It allows you to get something now that maybe you can't afford. If you can't afford to pay cash for a car or other large purchase, which most of us cannot, Using credit allows you then to get that item now. You can take advantage of sales with credit. If you truly have a need for something that's on sale and you don't have the cash once again, credit allows you to get it now. So it also, I think most importantly, establishes credit history. Buying something on credit with some creditors, even when you can afford to pay cash for it, means that you have a credit record and you start building your credit history. Now, using credit also has some disadvantages. Credit almost always costs money. You have to decide if the item is worth the extra expense of interest paid, the rate of interest, 
and possible fees. It can also become a habit encourage and encourage overspending. By simply having a credit card available, a person is likely to spend more when shopping than when paying cash for everything. Also, overuse of credit leads to a poor credit record, and a poor credit record means you will find it more difficult and more expensive to find future credit. And one more thing. A disadvantage of credit can reduce your future buying power because your future income is tied up in credit payments. If you use credit, part of everything you earn in the future is going towards what you bought in the past. Now, the cost of using credit, let's go over some definitions of each cost. A finance charge is a fee charged for the use of credit of the extension or existing credit. A finance charge is often the total cost of borrowing, including the cost of carrying the debt, along with any related transaction fees, account maintenance fees, or late fees charged by the lender. Interest is the amount of money a lender or financial institution receives for lending out money, usually expressed as a percentage. You will see this range anywhere from 4% on a mortgage today to 26 or 27% on some credit cards that exist and will definitely have an effect on the monthly payments as you'll see in one of my examples. A late fee, also known as a past due fee, is a charge fined against a client by a company or organization for not paying a bill or returning maybe a, rent or a rented or borrowed item by its due date. Its use is most commonly associated with businesses like creditors such as banks or credit card companies. And the term default rate, also called a penalty rate, may also refer to the higher interest rate that's imposed on a borrower who has missed regular payments on a loan. And finally, closing costs are typically part of purchasing a home and mortgage expenses throughout Maybe, maybe through a bank, they may range from 3 to 6% of the home's purchase price. So therefore, if you buy a house for, say, 200000 your closing costs could range anywhere from 6000 to 12000 Closing costs and fees vary depending upon your state, your loan type, and the mortgage lender. So it's important to pay close attention to those fees. So let's quickly take a look at an example at a credit card, and this is the cost of using a credit at, um, it's a credit card interest rate using 17%, and usually your minimum payment is going to run around 2.5% or $10. So if you have a balance of $1,000 on a credit card, and it takes, and you're taking 12 years to pay it off, the interest charged at 17% is $979. So on that $1,000 purchase, you're actually paying $1,979. Now in the same scenario, if you had a $2,500 balance and took 19 years to pay off, the interest charged at 17% would be $2,941. So if you tack that on, the total amount of the per or the total amount that you would be paying would be $5,441. And finally, if you purchase something for $5,000 and have that balance on your credit card, and it took you 24 plus years to pay that off, your interest would accrue and would actually be $6,210. And when you add that on to the $5,000, you're actually paying $11,210 on a $5,000 purchase. So as you can see, credit can get you in trouble even though it may get what you want at the time that you want it. Now we're going to switch gears and look at managing debt, or what is considered good debt versus bad debt, and how we can manage that debt to our advantage. So debt is something, usually money, borrowed by one party from another. Debt is used by many individuals to make large purchases that they could not afford under normal circumstances. 
A debt arrangement gives the borrowing party, you, permission to borrow money under the condition that it is to be paid back later at a later date, usually with interest. But before you take on any debt, consider whether a car loan or a new credit card will help you meet your financial goals or make them more difficult to accomplish. The type of debt you take along, along with the quantity and cost, can mean the difference between good debt and bad debt. A credit card, for example, can be a means to financing large expenses and earning reward points, but if not managed carefully, as you just saw, a credit card debt with high interest can spiral out of control. So what is good debt? Low interest debt that helps you increase your income or net worth are examples of good debt. But too much of any kind of debt, no matter the opportunity it might can create, can turn into bad debt. So medical debt, for example, doesn't really neatly fall into the, into the good or bad debt category. It's just an expense that's largely uncontrollable and often doesn't have an interest rate associated with the cost. But some prime examples of good debt are student loans because they typically are regarded as an investment in your future, and they tend to have lower interest rates, especially if they're federal student loans. And another example of good debt is a mortgage, because likely it's the biggest financial decision you're going to make. A mortgage is the path to home ownership. However, know how much house you can afford before shopping, and limit a mortgage payment to around 36% of your income. For many, a car. It's essential for everyday life. A rule of thumb there, though, is to keep your auto costs, including your car loan payment, within 20% of your take-home pay. Now, what do we consider bad debt? Expensive debts that drag down your financial situation are considered bad debt. Examples include debts with high or variable interest rates, especially when used for discretionary expenses or things that lose value. Sometimes bad debts are just good debts gone bad. Credit card debt is an example of this. If you have a high interest credit card and you pay off your balance each month, no problem, consider good debt. But if a high interest credit card debt builds up, you could be in trouble and it's considered bad debt. So let's take a look at high interest credit cards, such as those cost greater than 20%. They can make your debt more expensive. If you're not making progress on all your credit card debt despite paying what you can monthly, it might be a sign that you're facing problem problematic credit card debt and you may wanna look at doing something about it. Personal loans could possibly be considered bad debt for discretionary purchases. Taking on debt for expenses like a vacation or new clothes can be an expensive habit. Personal loans can be a good option if you have a specific goal in mind, such as consolidating debt. And payday loans. Payday loans are a bad debt that can turn toxic because they often become, they often come with high interest rates, some as 100, 200% something just totally out of whack that can make them immediately unaffordable. And these short-term small amount loans are meant to be repaid with your next paycheck. So be careful. Now let's take a look at how we can manage all of that debt. Debt management is basically defined as the practice of keeping debt under control and monitoring spending to ensure that that debt accrued does not become overwhelming. There are three ways in which you can manage your debt, and they include a debt reduction schedule, which is simply a plan to help you reduce your debt according to your budget, and it's usually made up of six easy steps. One, make a list of all your debts on paper. Two, rank those debts. Three, find extra money to pay those debts. Four, focus on one debt at a time. And five, move on to the next step on your list. So as we move on and we look at possibly um, a debt reduction schedule, there are several spreadsheets or even free calculators online that can assist you in setting up a debt reduction schedule 
to get you back on track. Next, a debt consolidation plan consists of two goals, lower overall interest rates and lowering overall payments. Although we covered what a debt, consolida I'm sorry, a debt consolidation loan was earlier in the presentation, I will caution you that this option requires discipline and commitment, making payments on time, saving the difference in payments since your consolidation payment should be lower, and avoiding new debt are all important steps for this choice. And lastly, credit counseling. Credit counselors offer a variety of services, including everything from providing basic money management advice to setting up a plan to help you pay off debt. In some cases, credit counselors can negotiate lower interest rates reduce monthly payments and more with your creditors, which could obviously save you money. It can often be an alternative to bankruptcy if you are that far in debt, which could help substantially in the long run. And as always, you can always look at your local bank to go in and talk to them about maybe what one of your alternatives might be. But in conclusion, the benefits of managing your finances intelligently can build wealth for you and your family and improve the quality of your life. So pay off that debt now and live the life that you are meant to be. I thank you once again for joining me today and I will take any questions if they're out there. All right, thank you very much, Carrie. Um, one of the questions um, was kind of about the, those payday loans. Did you say 100 to 200% interest on those? I did. I did because of the convenience of a payday loan, meaning that you get the money right away and it's a short term loan. And so that you're actually receiving your paycheck maybe a month early or however often you get paid. They tend to um, charge a very, very high interest rate for that convenience. But remembering that if you use the money you get from that payday loan, the next time your paycheck comes in, it goes back to paying off that payday loan, so therefore you don't have a paycheck. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question that we had was um, sort of surrounding the, the building of credit. There, there oftentimes seems to be um, a catch-22 where in order to try to build credit, you try to get a credit card or something like that, and then they tell you that you can't get a credit card because you have no credit. So what sort of uh, options or suggestions might you have for someone in that situation? So usually credit card companies or even banks will offer uh, secured products. So for instance, we have a secured credit card um, that, that we offer. So if, if there is a young person or, or even you know, um, someone that is in the working field that wants to open up a credit card and have you know, just for emergencies, but they don't have any credit, um, a secured credit card might work for them. And basically what that means is you would secure the credit card with cash. So when you apply for the credit card, you would also write a check for whatever you want that line of credit to be. So if you're just going to use it for emergencies, you may only want to apply for 1000 or you may want to apply for 5000 if you have the cash. But along with the application, you would simply write a check from your, from your savings account um, or your checking, and you would accompany that with your application, and then they would actually hold that that um, cash. And so then, if any for any reason you defaulted, like on your line, they can always go back and collect the cash. And the same thing works for a loan as well. We have CD secured loans. So what would happen is if you needed a five thousand dollar loan, you could invest five thousand dollars into a CD. We hold that as collateral and we give you the money. So it helps rather than, you know, using everything, using your cash for anything that you need. It helps to kind of um, apply for a secured credit card or apply for a secured installment loan at your bank. Okay, that's good advice. Um, so uh, when it comes to the, the chart that you had showed earlier about the, the amount of interest that you pay, um, are credit card companies... Um, do they put those kinds of charts like on their statements now or like does it show somewhere as to how 
the amount of interest you're paying affects how long yeah. you have to pay? Yes, and they usually do because I'll tell you why. It's so difficult right now to figure out how your um, how your credit um, and interest and what you're paying back. It's very difficult. It's a very um, difficult and um, I guess um, as far as the as far as the formula goes, it can be very confusing. And so rather than have you just try to figure it out yourself, they do put those on your credit card now. So they do show you, you know, if you take if you pay off monthly, obviously you don't have any interest charges. But if you, you know, um, if you continue to make the minimum payment for the next five years or 10 years or 25 years, it will tell you how much interest you are accruing and how much actually you will be paying back at the end. Excellent. All right. Well, those were the only questions that we had, but I thought the information is very valuable. Um, just as the the last two sessions have been, um, anybody who's who's not uh, catching up with these should definitely uh, look to see if we can find the recordings online. I think that uh, it's definitely something that's worth the time. Uh, so, Carrie, thank you very much for your uh, your time and and the uh, amount of time you've devoted to, to doing this for us. And uh, we do have one last installment, as Carrie mentioned earlier, next week, we are going to do sort of a wrap up that brings uh, all of the last uh, three sessions of information together into some examples of, of uh, how to hopefully have a, a solid financial footing. Thank you, Drew.